Sony Online Entertainment and moderator Jeff Keeley, host of Spike TV's GTTV, and their uh, panel is going to be the democratization of gaming, the evolution of the online game. So please welcome. See you all. Uh, great to be here at Games Beat, uh, interviewing my buddy John Smedley, who. Uh, I remember many years ago when I was just out of college, I went down to Sony Online and did a story on uh, what was Evercrack at the time, the story of, of EverQuest for Business 2.0 and the rise of that uh, game. And you guys have, have quietly been uh, moving along there down in San Diego, building a really cool company on um, Sony Online Entertainment. And today we're going to talk about, sort of, I think, really the, the evolution of that company and how you guys have evolved from EverQuest, which was a big phenomenon in the MMO space. Um, I guess it was, was it late. Eight, nine, early it was uh, 99? It was March 16th of 1999. Wow. A lot of fun. Been a long, fun journey. <laughs> yeah, and you, and you guys are, are now doing new things. I think part of what we want to talk about today is the democratization of gaming and bringing sort of power to the players, giving power to the players um, as part of your, your platform at Sony Online. So, so first of all, that's, that's a big term, democratizing gaming, and a lot of things are being democratized on the internet. Um, user base, but what do you, how do you define the democratization of gaming, especially through the prism of Sony Online? Sure. Um, our belief at Sony Online is that we're going to see this big movement, and we are already seeing it, where gamers are going to be participating in the process. Now, they're not just going to be participating in by playing the game, they're going to be participating in the ecosystem around the game, and they're going to help drive the game. And the best example I can give of this is our uh, a roadmap that we developed on Planet Side 2, which is our recently launched um, massively multiplayer first person shooter. What we did was we put something up called the roadmap. We laid out for the next six months, here are the features we plan on delivering in roughly speaking order that we want to deliver them in, kind of group by month. And they could vote uh -huh. on the features, Reddit style. We put we, we straight up uh, used the Reddit style voting system uh, in our own forums and, and let people vote. This had an interesting effect. Um, a lot of stuff we thought was really awesome, they downloaded to zero. Um, and a lot of the stuff we didn't think would be that big a deal, they voted up. So we changed our development plans completely based around what they were talking about. Yeah, you know, some people will look at that and say, that's fantastic, you're empowering the community. Other folks will look at it and say, hey, you know, they're not gonna know what they want until they see it. It's a bunch of new. you need to you need to drive in a certain direction. It's like you know, similar to like focus grouping. A game to death or something. Absolutely. Like, hey, it's like you're, there's not a vision anymore. You're just going where the players want to go. They don't know where they want to go. So how do you balance that out? So um, you know, you're building something that ultimately may be you know the game you want to make, but also involve players, but don't let them sort of you know run an anarchy around like right. development plans. Well, that's the interesting balance, and I think we've managed to kind of thread the needle pretty well in that. What we've done is remember that we're the ones that are creating the roadmap in the first place. So what we're basically doing is saying, here is where we want to take this game. Within that, here are some boundaries, where here are the options, what's more important to you, what's less important to you. That way we're still taking the game in the direction that we as creators of it really uh, feel is the right one. And frankly, that's kind of what keeps us you know, coming to work every day, is making sure that you know, we're having a good time and we're doing the kind of fun stuff we like to do. Are players ever wrong, though? Sure, they're wrong all the time. I got, a, uh, I got an email from a player the other day. It was a very tough email to get. It was an email telling me, um, I'm going to quit your game and request it. And this guy laid out his case for why he's going to quit our game. And the reason was because his wife had gotten scammed by um, some guy on the internet selling virtual <laughs> currency codes. And he was telling me how I was an idiot and our company was screwed up because we let that happen. And I thought, well, that's against the rules. We made those rules to specifically prohibit that. And it ended up that all is well that ends well. He ended up uh, staying after I explained the, the rationale behind it. But players can be wrong, but the thing is is that we make entertainment. We're fun. We, we make fun things. So it's, fun is very subjective. So what's fun to one person is not to another. Now, you know, over the years, you and I are both PC gamers have been for a long time. We've seen you know the mod community and things like that that happened you know around the you know, mid '90s with Doom and things like that, and led into uh, you know a lot of other sort of player created content. And we sort of see things now like the Steam Workshop. You guys have sort of you know the player studio allow people to sort of be a part of these games. 
Um, how important is that, do you think, moving forward, not just for Sony, but for the game industry, sort of being involved in player and creative content in these titles? I don't think I can put uh, you know, a more important um, thing above anything else in gaming. To me, players being involved in the creation of the content is, is a must. They're, they're participating in the ecosystem. So for example, in our, in our, our uh, company, we made something called Player Studio. Uh, Player Studio allows players to make things for qualified games. We, we approve them, put them in the marketplace, and sell them. And then we cut them checks. And we've been doing this for six months. I'm pretty excited by it. So for example, we have this uh, Planet Side 2. We have a player who's 16 years old. I, I have not met him yet. Um, I can't wait to. He does not even know that he's about to get an $8,000 check from us. Uh, 16 year old kid. What were you guys doing when you were 16? I was mowing lawns and chasing girls, right? This kid made textures for Planet Side 2, and just a simple act like that, he's going to be getting this check. His mom knows he doesn't get it. So that's going to be pretty, uh, pretty cool. That's, that's power. That when players can participate in the very thing they love, I can't think of anything that's better. But there's a more solid reason for needing this. In online gaming, we have a really simple problem that we face. It's called content um, eating. What that means is that when EverQuest launched in 99, there was no ThoughtBot, there were no, there were some crude websites, but what there wasn't was a simple place to find every single piece of information about that game. Our belief is that we cannot stay ahead of the content curve for the players, and people that, that chase that are crazy. If you look at WoW, WoW's had nine years to run. Who's going to go up against nine years of content? EverQuest has had 14 years of running. How are we going to go up against that kind of content? We need the players' help. If they can help us make cool new things and we can put them into the game, that helps us stay ahead. It makes the other players happy. It's a win-win, and they make money from it. So you've got, you know, that's typically happening, I think, a lot on the PC side uh, of, of, the, of the business. What about the console side? Are you guys going to have things like a Absolutely. Player Studio on console? Player Studio is actually coming in. We are a launch title um, with DC Universe Online on the PlayStation 4. Um, but, and that title won't have Player Studio on it. It's, you know, it's Warner Brothers property. It's kind of hard to, to um, nice. do that with license titles. Can you imagine if we've done that with Star Wars and the kind of user submissions that we get for Star Wars? Yeah. That would be pretty cool if you ask me, but we wouldn't be able to do it. But in this, um, for Planet Side 2, which is coming to the um, PlayStation 4 in, uh, in early next year, we actually have Player Studio built in. So console players, for the first time, are going to be able to participate in making money back. And they'll be able to sell stuff on PlayStation 4. Absolutely. And build an economy. Kind of Absolutely. Again. Wow, very interesting. So you know, that idea of players creating content, you're sort of taking that to the next level with uh, EverQuest Next, which you guys have announced uh, last year and been talking about it. Um, and also there's something tied to that in Landmark. Can you sort of explain how you're now sort of actually bringing players in, not to sort of create content to augment an already completed game, but actually bring them in as part of the development yeah. process? It's kind of cool. We, um, EverQuest Next, we, we, we threw away the game um, twice before. We were making Me Too, WoW clones, EQ2 clones. We were making the same game that's been made for 10 years. We kind of had enough of it. It was boring to us. Forget the players. We were bored with it. Um, so we wanted to invent something new. So we did. We made this amazing game where the entire world is destructible. It's all editable. It's all voxel-based. And what we're doing is, um, as we started to build the tools for this, we're like, wait a minute. This is too much fun. We're having a good time making stuff, and we're not even at the content part of the game. Right. So we decided to separate it. So EverQuest Next Landmark um, is actually its own unique snowflake. It's about building, it's about adventuring, it's about um, you know, finding resources. It's a social building MMO. We're still making EverQuest Next, which is coming out uh, you know, in the future here, uh, not, not too distant future, but the players now are gonna get to participate in Landmark. And stuff they make in Landmark, if it's approved, you know, because we wanna make sure the theme is kept. Uh, we don't want the Starship Enterprise to this way into EverQuest. Um, if it's approved, they're going to literally be able to take the things they make in Landmark and actually bring them over to EverQuest Next. Can you imagine how powerful it is when you make your own castle and it's in the game on day one? Our hope is that players never want to leave. Well, I saw like you go to this website 
that you guys are interested in, you should check it out. And you can literally upload like 3D geometry and stuff like yeah. OBJ and other things like that. So people, what is part you actually, you upload things and then you guys look at it and say, hey, we might use this yeah. again. Yeah, they upload it. Um, we review it, make sure that the content is good. Um, and what's fun about it is that we get to um, give them the feedback. They get to talk directly with developers. So there isn't like some thing that we're, uh, keeping separate from everybody. It's actually the developers on the games themselves are saying, hey, this is good, this sucks, you should change this, you know, this would make it feel more like... There's a dialogue that's going to happen. It's Absolutely. Like it's a lot of fun. Well, I, I think, I mean, for people that want to break into the industry, I, I always remember when I first started covering the business, a lot of the developers I met were folks from the mod community that were getting hired into these developers, so I'm sure it's a great way for you. Have you found employees or potential employees through this? I imagine you have. We have. And yeah. in fact, the in fact, right you know, in, in the W Hotel in San Francisco, there's a demo going on right now of uh, from one of the guys that, that we found this way. He yeah. turned out to be one of the most brilliant builders that I've ever seen. And you know, our tech is pretty cool, but what really makes it neat is when the players make fun stuff. So you know, players are submitting stuff. The landmark that will appear in request next. How do you still sort of surprise players that want to you know have a game experience? And you know, like, are you spoiling the game for them because they're sort of contributing content to it and they're Dialogue with the developers, or the things that you can wall off and say, like, hey, well, we're actually going to create this part of the game, this area, we're not going to involve players. So, so that's the difference between EverQuest Next and Landmark. EverQuest Next Landmark is all about the players. <coughs> it's all about them building amazing things and participating uh, with each other. EverQuest Next is a more traditional virtual world where we built it and we've gotten help from the players, but we're not getting help on things like lore or any of the quests or this the fun stuff that players want to experience. We don't want to, to show the whole book to them so that they know every piece of the story. That wouldn't be any fun. And I mean, you know, let's talk a bit about sort of the, the business model for this stuff. And you say, you know, players are obviously contributing and making money back. But I mean, are you, are you still a believer in the idea of, you know, subscriptions or free to play? Or how do you imagine these games sort of to roll out to consumers that just want to consume them? Because we know on the internet, there's a certain number of people that just want to play games. They don't want to uh, create content for them. So our goal with EverQuest Next and Landmark is to have the business model be as invisible to the players as they can. We, we've you know, been operating free-to-play games for a long time now. What we find is that we don't want things that are in their face. Uh, we don't want anything that's pay to win. That's not, you know, it's not us as gamers, so we don't want to be that way as game makers either. But what we do is um, we're focused on making sure that the, the, all the stuff that the players are engaged in is Kind of in a way, um, it's all say, appropriate. Um, we, we make sure that everything they're they're getting is, you know, it's the way we want it. Right. And it's their creation. That's the way we want it. So we kind of want to keep the reins on that. So you know, if I if I'm contributing content to this as a game, right? I say, well, what am I getting back? And then it's money off it. If people buy it in the game, but I mean, am I going to pay to play this game, or is it I want to buy other players' creations? How does um, so we have all kinds of uh, ways that players can spend money. They can uh, they can they get a free plot of land uh, when they come in, and if you want to get a bigger plot, that will cost money. Um, kind of all the traditional trappings of free play games, but with a focus on, and this is a key differentiator. SOE is no longer interested in separating players by content with free-to-play. It's a huge mistake to do that. Because, let me give you a great example. If this was a free-to-play game, you don't want to sell levels. Why? Because instantly, your user base is separated by the haves and the have-nots. And you have a bunch of people that are in one. You see this in, in shoot, shooters today. If you buy, if you play Call of Duty and you don't have the expansion pack and your buddy does, you're screwed. You can't play it on that map. You guys have to play it on something else. We don't want that. We're going to be doing it by features. Yeah. And I think that's going to help a lot. To do it by features and obviously involve players in the creation um, from the get-go, which I think is, you know, a big opportunity, which we're seeing kind of across the board. You know, from a business perspective with SOE, do you see this idea, is this going to, you know, bleed into, you've got Planet Side, I'm sure you guys are working on other things. I mean, is this sort of the new path forward for all your games, or is this unique just to it is. It's the path forward for all our games. Uh, we're big believers in this democratization thing. I mean, you're seeing, this is a time in gaming in general when there are no more rules. Traditional journalism um, has been, you know, very in a very large way, uh, still a part of it, but you've now got Reddit. 
Yeah. And I don't know about you guys, but when I want to buy a new game or when I find out when I want to find out about something, I go and I read. Yeah. So we're going to have on our own site, we're going to have reviews of all the items. Okay. It's very similar to Amazon in that um, just because we're selling it doesn't mean that, the, that every player will want it. Um, so we want to make sure that they're able to review the, the stuff, and if they hate an item and everybody votes it down to you know one star, then other people won't buy it. To me, that's the way it should be. Now, another part of sort of this player creative content is, is esports. I know you guys are doing a bit of that with uh, Planet Side, oh, yeah. looking at that. Um, tell me about sort of that revolution, because I mean we see you know the League of Legends finals, the Staples Center. I mean, it's amazing the, uh, the number of people. Who, uh, who, who watch watch people play games? I'm curious your thoughts on esports. So I, I, I love watching uh, real sports on HBO. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have seen yeah. it. They had a piece on that. And, you know, we've hit the big time if we're on the yeah. real sports. I guess I don't know. Um, to me, esports is it's, it's just a prime example of how um, how fast the world is moving. Um, we're with Planetside Two. We're making an esports mode. We're partnered with the MLG. Uh, and this largely came out of simply a love. All of us at, at SOE, well, a lot of us, I should say, watch Twitch every night. Watch Dota 2. I play a lot of Dota 2. Watch League of Legends. Um, these are the kind of things that the users are now able to watch you know, the, the pros play, and it gets them excited. It gets them to want to go to it. When you, when you see the numbers that are coming out of these broadcasts, it's astounding. Yeah. And it's hitting mainstream. Well, mainstream for geeks, right? My wife is never going to give a crap about any of this. Uh, she's never going to watch an uh, esports event with me. So I'm working on it. But. Yeah, I mean, the, and you can watch it on, on your computer now. I mean, a great resolution. Actually, it's better. Than throw it up on the TV. You know, that's the that's the best thing. I can't wait till the Apple TV has a Twitch mode built into it. Right. That's something else. So how's it going to affect how you build games moving forward? Like, you know, Planet Side, I assume, is again, you know, franchise you want to continue, and then that MMO shooter. Yeah. So so uh, you know, we've got other things other than Planet Side in the uh, in the shooter bucket that we're making. Um, and esports is a very heavy part of that, of what we're doing there. Esports isn't a one size fits all thing, right? So Climate Side is a very unique game. It, very few games have uh, 2,000 players in uh, playing. And Climate Side is that kind of game. So we have to make a, a more of a viewing experience than, than normal esports. It's more like um, if you watch golf. You know, it's, it's more like that, where um, people that are excited about it will watch it. Yeah. And our belief is that if you can make what you're viewing fun, uh, that that's the most important thing. The actual participants, if you think about it, is in, in League of Legends and Dota 2, it's five on five. Not a lot of people get to experience it. What's fun about it? The viewing experience, the, the excitement of that. So that's what we want to recreate. So you've obviously got you know a, a very clear view on what this democratization of games means. And we got these new consoles coming out uh, this holiday season. Yes. A lot of debate and discussion about kind of where the business is going. Um, do you think the rest of the industry, how are they, you obviously have this view very strongly, <laughs> is the rest of the industry, do you think, should it come along, or what, what's your message to sort of the console companies and the other developers out here uh, about this opportunity? So we're a Sony company, so I'm fortunate enough to get to see the inside workings of, and the behind the scenes stuff. Um, and I can say Sony gets it, I'm not, this isn't, you know, me being a shill for Sony here, I'm just telling you what I see. Um, they get it. Uh, free to play games are going to be a big part of what the PlayStation 4 is. Um, and I, to, to me, it's, it's a hugely uh, empowering thing because PCs and consoles are getting closer. I don't know if you guys have been paying attention to this, but watch something very interesting. Um, very recently, uh, the, the folks at Activision announced that, they were, that Call of Duty on the PC is going to require 64 bit OS. You know, I hope we're all watching what that means. That's a profound change in PC gaming when you, the biggest game on PC is now requires a 64-bit OS. That's 100% because consoles, the next-gen consoles, particularly the PS4, are leading this challenge um, in a way that's going to impact PC gaming. The same is going to be true for the things that are democratic about um, about the PC space. You're seeing more and more of that come over to the PlayStation space. Yeah. And hopefully, I mean, content I assume will then be able to be shared between these platforms. And that's the exciting feature that I think we have. Awesome, Brian. Right. We're looking forward to seeing what SOE has in store in the years to come. Thanks for uh, taking the time, John. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thank